It's a great pleasure to be back at DAFIX. It's been several years for me, maybe a decade actually. Uh, and it's a great city and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces again and a lot of new faces. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that lasted for me right, maybe my third decade working on river, artificial reverberation now, but uh, with a progression towards the more recent uh, applications around virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, specifically, what I'd like to do is start from um, the, what I would call the cinematic applications, such as music, soundtracks, and even cinematic VR, even though it's recent, uh, it still can use the traditional reverberation uh, production techniques that you use when mixing or recording, um, as opposed to uh, applications that are dynamic, like game audio was the first one that I was involved in uh, when I just after moving to the States. Uh, actually, SPAT development for music creation was also, it's a, it was a, a real-time concert application, so that was also dynamic. And uh, all these technologies are now evolving towards application in virtual reality and augmented reality. And augmented reality is a very exciting challenge because it's the first time that we can hear the rendering of sounds and compare immediately, instantly, with real sounds that we can hear at the same time which is, makes, me, makes it very exciting to me. Um, so general questions, uh, starting from the beginning, is can we make reverberation realistic? Is there any reason that we can claim we can actually imitate it artificially? Um, can we make it so well that it can be indistinguishable from the reverberation in the real room that we could have recorded with microphones and an instrument playing? Um, can we uh, control it parametrically? So if, if you're authoring a recording, it's not enough to just be able to record an impulse response or record, uh, you know, let's say, a performance. You're actually probably going to want to fine-tune the sound. And that's when parametric control of the algorithm is going to be necessary, uh, uh, including parametric control of the reverberation time of, of the algorithm. And then finally, that's having done all that, uh, which we would not necessarily need for uh, dynamic applications like virtual reality and augmented reality, we're going to want to uh, insert the algorithm inside an environment where there may be multiple sources playing, multiple rooms that we have to navigate through, and uh, we may be moving, and the source may be moving. And that adds another level of challenges uh, of dynamically updating uh, the reverberation, the reflections, stitching the reverberation and the reflections in a way that makes sense uh, and is going to be realistic, especially if we can compare in real time what's happening when other sounds are playing in the room, uh, which would be the case in augmented reality. So uh, first question, I'm just going to start with the rendering. Part one will be static rendering of reverberation. And then uh, quickly, uh, I'll, I'll be a little quick on the traditional uh, algorithms because I, have, I think I have too much material for an hour. So I'll be a little bit on, uh, quick on the algorithms to, go quick, uh, to transition into the dynamic uh, applications. But let's just first discuss uh, why would we be able to uh, uh, you know, claim that we can artificially uh, simulate reverberation. Uh, just with one source and one listener, and they are determined we may have recorded an impulse response, and we just don't want to do convolution uh, with the impulse response. Or, uh, that's an option, you know. Uh, but if we change the source and the receiver, we may not have a good impulse response to use anymore. Um, or, uh, instead of convolution, we may use a recursive algorithm, and I'm going to quickly discuss that before I move to the dynamic applications. So first, uh, what justifies uh, being able to artificially simulate it? Well, it turns out that if you look at an impulse response uh, in a time frequency domain, there's a time after which it takes a random nature because of the overlap of all the reflections, and there's a frequency over, over which, usually called the shorter frequency, over which it also take a random nature due to the overlap of modes. And in this area of the time and frequency domain, it can be replaced uh, by a exponentially decaying random process, uh, such that if you give it the right decay time as a function of frequency, the replacement is not going to be audible. You, you can measure an impulse response, replace that part, of the time frequency domain in the impulse response, and it'll sound the same. Um, 
and that's simply because our brain is not able to hear the detail uh, of the information that's in there. And that's due to the fact that echo density and, and modal density both increase uh, with time and frequency, respectively. Um, so one way to simulate that uh, artificially is to filter uh, the input into multiple bands, give all the frequency bands different decay times, and just play a pink noise uh, or white noise through this. Uh, that was an idea proposed by Moore. And if you look at all you have to know about uh, the, the information you have to have in mind uh, to represent what's happening is just uh, a three-dimensional uh, representation like this where there's a starting uh, spectrum from which we decay exponentially at different decay rates uh, depending on frequency. So this is our model of the reverberation that we can hope to simulate artificially. And we could do that by convolution as I described uh, whether we have measured or modeled or uh, synthesized the impulse response, or we could do it with a recursive network. So I'll quickly go over the recursive network approach um, in order to then transition to a part of the talk where with whichever method you use to simulate it doesn't actually matter because we're going to focus on the dynamic aspects at this point. Um, so. The general uh, approach that I've been advocating for designing these kinds of algorithms is to work in two steps. Uh, the first step is to uh, pick a reverb topology that's a number of delay units that are uh, fed back to each other uh, into a network. And as long as the impulse response of that uh, network is such that when you send a pulse, what comes out is a stationary white noise you have what we can call a, a lossless prototype feedback delay network, which is, uh, the term lossless prototype was actually proposed by Julius Smith. Uh, some, some, of, some of these very nice names I didn't come up with myself because I'm French and I, I don't have the right names first. I have the same problem with the name of the city. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Uh, maybe at the end of the talk when I'm a little more warmed up. Um, so, so first we have this lossless prototype. And then we're going to have a bunch of a number of delay units inside that network. And we're just simply going to attenuate, to associate an attenuation that can be frequency dependent to each of the delays in that network. And the reason why that would work is that we can define an attenuation per unit of time uh, that may be a frequency dependent attenuation. And as long as we put a filter with each delay that respects that uh, per uh, attenuation per unit of time, uh, it's going to basically replace the stationary white noise that was our impulse response with a sculpted decaying white noise that ref uh, respects, uh, that uh, corresponds to the model that I described, the 3D model of exponential decay with a different decay time at each frequency. But it will start with a flat uh, spectrum. So uh, I said I would be quick on that, so I'll go straight to the most general way I can think of uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, envision uh, feedback data networks. And uh, I, I think if we, uh, if we have a vector uh, uh, of inputs, multi-channel input and multi-channel output, and we uh, consider two uh, matrix uh, all-pass filters, unitary uh, uh, multi-channel networks. Uh, here they are denoted U1 and U2. And we, couple, we associate them the way that they are here. We have a very vast uh, uh, class of networks that will be usable to uh, try to design a lossless prototype. Um, the simplest one that uh, is usually the one that's called a feedback linear network in, uh, in most discussions is the one where uh, the U1 here is the diagonal matrix of delay lines. So there's a single delay line from each input to each output. And U2 is a, a unitary matrix, usually called A. Um, but that's just one way to do it. One, one way, uh, however, it's useful to think of it this way because it's also the canonical representation of a IAR network where instead of unit delays, you replace each of the delays by, uh, uh, by delay lengths, delay lines, a smaller number of delay lines 
that uh, maybe like four, eight, ten delay lines uh, that give you a, a kinetic representation of just this feedback delay network. So uh, historically, now that we consider, uh, you know, we have a general way to uh, endow, uh, endow the feedback delay network, uh, the prototype network with a decay, uh, exponentially decay, the only problem we have is what topology I'm going to start with. Uh, and we can go back to the old uh, proposals, the very early proposals, such as the, the, the pioneering work of Schroeder, where the, it's basically this method of having a diagonal uh, set of data lines and feeding back each of them on itself. It's a diagonal feedback matrix in that case. And then the all-pass filters are just added to add more density. But that's one pot potential prototype. Um, one that's a, a trick that's very useful in the design of those prototype networks is to use the multi-channel all-pass uh, proposal that Gerson uh, uh, offered in the 70s uh, and use that, what you see on the screen here, as your uh, unitary uh, network. So, but we can put several of them in cascade. Uh, we can design nested combination of these where the A of Z is itself a unitary network. Um, we have the proposal by St Stotner and Puckett, now in the, we're in the 80s, where it's basically the one that uh, inspired me to then try to be, try to be even more general uh, by matrix the, the, making the matrix fuller. Um, and now, now we have what's you, uh, very often called a, the feedback delay network uh, representation, where because it has this canonical uh, uh, nature to it, you can actually go into the details of what would be the transfer function of that. Can you uh, use general mathematical uh, theorems to uh, predict where the poles might end up? Are they going to be in the unit circle or not, etc.? If you do it in th with this uh, in mind, then it, uh, the analysis that uh, is deducted from this applies to any of, the other, any of the other topologies, because any topology can be brought back into uh, this model. At least the feedback part of it can be brought back into this representation. So other variants, uh, the work by Dator and Griesinger, uh, where you have these nested all-pass filters all uh, connected together in such a way that they are still, the combination is still a unitary feedback uh, delay network. Um, this is a very simple one. Uh, the top one is very simple because it uses a householder matrix where you have a full feedback matrix, but we have very few uh, multiply adds that we have to use. And then Van Annen extended that by uh, inserting all-pass filters in, the, in cascade with each delay line. If you insert an all-pass filter with a delay, you still have something unitary. So these kinds of combinations are, are, are going to work for your prototype network. Uh, Middle Packet uh, proposed another approach where the R is unitary. The feedback that you see is unitary. Therefore, the energy that comes in and that comes out is the same. So this is also a unitary uh, system. Um, so now we have all these prototype delay networks that we could use, and we have uh, an impulse response. We can tweak everything we, that in there, the delay line lengths and everything, so that when you send a pulse into it, very quickly that pulse uh, becomes something like that does and does not decay. So we need to now insert uh, some attenuations with each of the delay units that compose our network. And the general rule then is that the attenuation, if, if you express it in dB, the attenuation as a function of frequency of each of the filters that you associate, associate to the delay lines, it needs to be proportional to the delay line. It's an attenuation, so it's a negative number. And it's uh, proportional to the reciprocal of the decay time. So that if the decay time is longer, the attenuation in dB is going to be proportionally la longer. Um, uh, multiplied as well. In other words, it's going to attenuate less since it's a negative number. Uh, so, uh, you know, one way to do this when, when I first tried this approach was uh, in, in the early 90s was to put a single pole uh, low pass filter uh, based on the proposal by Moore that was uh, to simulate air absorption with a one pole filter. And with that, you can. Uh, change it a bit so that it, it's not uh, limited to air absorption simulation, but can actually uh, be a tunable uh, or parametric uh, at uh, decay time control. But you have only two bands. You have low frequencies and high frequencies. 
And that works, it sounds nice, but it's limited uh, parametric control. So if we try to imagine the most general way to uh, design those um, absorptive filters, uh, which are basically equalizers, uh, what would be nice is a, a general class of equalizers that have this property that they form a family, uh, like if you have, say, eight different delay lines in your feedback data network, you need eight filters uh, that are equalizers, but their mutual uh, frequency responses are all proportional to each other when you look at them in dB because they are proportional to the delay lengths. So you can define what could be called a proportional parametric equalizer, and that's a broad family of equalizers. And then the challenge is how do you, can you design those things uh, easily? So uh, in my case, the first, my first attempt to, to do something like that, at that time I didn't give it a general name, but I wanted to have more than two bands. So I tried to design a, a biquad that would give you three bands, uh, attenuation at low frequencies, uh, a, a global uh, scaling factor, and attenuation at high frequencies. And you can do this with two shelving filters in cascade, and that, if they're first order, that gives you a, a biquad. And the challenge then is how to uh, compute, uh, you know, define the coefficients of uh, 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 this biquad or, or this cascade of first order shelving filters so that it has this property that all the, if you set the frequency, uh, the crossover frequency of your two shelving filters uh, and you increase the gain at low or high frequencies, it's forming a family of filters that are uh, uh, frequency responses in dB that are uh, mutually homothetic in the, on the vertical axis. Um, and if you have that, then you can use those things for uh, attenuation in a feedback data network for uh, reverberation. So in this case, for instance, when you see the lower uh, right one, uh, it's roughly simulating a pink noise, even though it's just a white noise going through a biquad. So, we needed, uh, to, to do this, we need uh, uh, to define a shelving filter, first order shelving filter. And th so the way I approached this was to take the, the classic uh, regalia metro uh, topology, but make a modification to it so that it would have this homothetic uh, property. And essentially equivalent to changing the crossover of the regalia metro uh, shelving filter, uh, depending on the gain uh, of the shelving filter. So when you have this family, of shelving filters, you can then use two together to do the, to, to have a dual shelving filter that's a three band uh, proportional equalizer. And if you want more bands, uh, typically in professional reverberators there are often four bands, uh, then it's useful to have also a, ver a proportional version of the peaking uh, equalizer. Um, so that was you, you see here where you've, we've set a center frequency, we've set a bandwidth, uh, and when we change the gain, we want all the filters, the family of uh, frequency response curves we get to be mutually homothetic, proportional to the gain we, we set. Uh, so same thing, uh, starting from the regalia metro filter, it's possible to actually pretend that you change the bandwidth of the regalia metro filter when you increase the gain in such a way that it behaves the, the way that's one, that we want. And then when we associate a multiple uh, of those in cascade, either shelving, so uh, high shelving, low shelving, and a number of bands in between with peaking filters, we can then, uh, the, the next uh, trick is to consider that when they are cascaded, their response in dB, uh, the response, frequency response in dB of each of the filters is gonna add up uh, linearly. Uh, so it's going to be, at each frequency, it's going to be a linear combination of the dB gains that you associated to each of the unit uh, individual filters. And since it's a linear combination, you can invert it. So in other words, you can say, I want a certain frequency response for my equalizer, and I can derive what gains I need to set to each of my elementary shelving or peaking filters so that the sum the cascade of all these responses is going to be uh, the result I want. So what you see here on the left is uh, we have three picking filters. It's just an example. Three picking realizers set to the same gain. And when we cascade them together, the uh, sum is not going to be flat, even though we set them all to the same gain. And there's a lot of uh, commercial equalizers that have this problem, um, in, in, it turns out. But if you uh, are, a, since we know 
what, uh, how the total response is going to be related to the setting of each of the gains uh, through a linear uh, equation, just by inverting uh, that formula, we're able to actually calculate what, set, what settings we need to uh, uh, adopt for each of the individual equalizers so that the total is going to be, is going to go through, in this case, three points at the three center frequencies of our equalizers where we've set, we've asked that they have the same, we obtain the same dB gain. And so the inversion just automatically gives us something that behaves better uh, than, than what, on, on that what you see on the right side is closer to what we wanted to achieve. And if we apply this approach, but now let's say to a 10 band equalizer, where each of the elementary equalizers is a peaking filter, that's a proportional filter, then we can design a 10 band proportional uh, graphic equalizer. So uh, if we wanted to use this uh, in a reverberator where we have a 10 band control over the decay time, we would be able to define, uh, uh, ob obtain uh, frequency responses that are in dB are uh, proportional to the decay time uh, or to its reciprocal and uh, proportional to the delay length of one of the of any of the delay units in the network so this allows us to uh, simulate this uh, um, behavior that I described earlier for the prototype uh, f f uh, you know, basically this uh, surface where you have a gain that depends that decays uh, energy that decays uh, exponentially at each frequency either by sculpting a piece of white noise uh, and as a, you know, splitting it into, into bands and applying a different decay, which gives you an impulse response, or with an IIR network, a feedback delay network, where we use these uh, absorptive filters in each, for each of the layer lines. So we have two equivalent methods to obtain the same result, which is a random uh, process that decays exponentially with a decay that's uh, depends the, the decay rate that depends on frequency on the frequency. Uh, so now that we know how to synthesize that, um, you know, given a certain decay time as a function of frequency, have this behavior. Uh, how could we try to make it uh, imitate the reverberation of a re, uh, that we measured in a real room from an impulse response? So uh, a method we can take is the uh, essentially a frequency domain expansion of the classic method that Schroeder, the same Schroeder, had proposed to uh, estimate the reverberation time, which is the time that reverberation decays by uh, 60 decibels in a, an impulse response. Uh, if we take an impulse response, but we first go to the frequency domain with short-term Fourier transform, for instance, and uh, then we have uh, split that response into multiple bands. And if we look at the decay in dB uh, at each of these bands in the response, there is the time after which, because we've reached the, the, what we call the late reverberation, we are going to observe a linear decay. And by you know, measuring the rate of decay at each frequency, then we have a decay time estimate, but that now it's a function of frequency that we can obtain with any uh, desired um, uh, resolution in the frequency domain. So when we have that, then we can stick that information into our feedback delay network or into our method to synthesize an impulse response and uh, obtain a reverberation that will sound exactly the same, at least for the part that's above the shorter frequency and after uh, the transition from early reflections to late reverberation. Uh, so an example would be here uh, where we measured uh, the initial spectrum and the decay time. So the initial spectrum is the, the frequency uh, spectrum we start with when, before we decay. Uh, we measured this in uh, two rooms. Uh, one is the Philharmonie in Berlin and the other one is the uh, Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. And we noticed some interesting, interesting things. Uh, the first one is they have different decay times. That lower plot is the decay time. Um, we can measure it with a high resolution with the, the method that we just discussed. And if we use the same microphone and the same loudspeaker in both concert halls, we find that the initial spectrum uh, that we obtain when we analyze the responses is the same except for an offset. And uh, 
uh, by looking more into this, uh, we have a way to explain what's going on here, and I'll talk about, uh, about it in a few minutes. So, uh, the other things we can do is uh, a problem we have when we measure impulse responses, uh, they have noise in them. Um, and so, therefore, one of the things we can do is if we want to restore the impulse response, usually it's the end of the impulse response that's uh, biased by the noise. Uh, so what we can try to do is actually sculpt the noise that's at the end of the impulse response to give it the decay time we want at each uh, time and frequency. And that, so that you see an, uh, an illustration of this uh, on the left side of the picture. So if you want to do convolution from a measured impulse response, we have to do this. Because if we don't restore it, uh, it's going to sound like the end of the decay is going to be an infinite decay. That's going to be the no, uh, result from the, of the noise we measured. Uh, this is an example of uh, in the early 90s of analyzing one particular room response and measuring uh, the decay time in it with the method I described and comparing then after resynthesizing with a feedback delay network, comparing the decay time we obtained. Uh, actually, I can use the little pointer. Um, uh, so here, the, uh, the up one, uh, you have the measured and the synthesized decay time. Of course, we have an artificial uh, offset between the two, so we can see both. But we can definitely see that we use the feedback delay network here. We use a family of absorptive filters that have this homothetic property. In this case, they were not parametrically controlled. It was using uh, the U-walk method in MATLAB to basically drive each of the filters uh, from um, the decay time and the length of each delay. And so we are able to prove that, yeah, we get the same decay time uh, with the feedback delay network. And we're also getting able to simulate very uh, closely the initial energy uh, at the beginning of the decay, uh, make it the same as the one we measured. So, you know, it, based on what you see here, it's a random process that's basically, uh, you know, under this curve, this 3D curve, it looks exactly the same whether you take the original one and the synthesized one. All right, so um, now we are going to go to the second part of this talk. I hope I have enough time. Ooh. Um, where we try to make all this dynamic. Uh, uh, and if we're in an application where somebody is de designing a dynamic, uh, like a game or virtual reality or augmented reality, there's a number, they have a number of problems. First thing, uh, they want to find, to author the content uh, or describe the scene as a dynamic scene such that the description does not depend on what playback system we're going to use. It could be headphones, it could be ambisonic uh, rendering, it could be multi-channel, any kind of multi-channel playback system. We need to describe the scene without knowing that in advance because people are going to play the content uh, on various types of uh, systems. Uh, also, they're going to play the content in powerful PCs or game consoles, but sometimes in less powerful PCs. So we need a more uh, scalable, uh, we need a scalable method to render uh, the content that we create. And then there's a problem that uh, there's always a person who tries to tune the sound, the sound designer, and uh, they need to have a way to tune that with parametrically. So if all the sound designer can do is measure impulse responses and that determines what the game or the application is going to sound like, and they have no parametric control over the result, their satisfaction is going to be uh, limited, reduced. Um, and we also don't have to simulate reality exactly, especially in applications such as movies and VR, because as long as it's plausible and we can imagine that there is a room somewhere in the world that could have sounded like that, that's enough. Uh, in augmented reality, it's different because now we can compare in real time uh, the synthetic uh, sound and the real sound. So um, I talked about the problem of uh, so basically now uh, what we need is a model of this decay, this exponential decay at a different rate at each frequency. But we need to be able to represent this so that it applies to any source in the room, whether it has, uh, it's very directive or less directive whether it's any way that it's oriented, any distance it is from us. Um, the positions of where it is with respect to the walls won't matter because we are still focusing on the late reverberation, which is the stochastic uh, diffuse part of the reverberation. Uh, 
Um, and so what I find useful as a, as a model to imagine what's happening if um, I don't know in advance where I'm going to listen to the reverberation. Up to now, I was talking about one position of the source, one position of the listener, known characteristics, and just an impulse response, I measured this uh, in this situation. Now I don't know where the source is uh, or the listener and what are the characteristics of the source. But if we, uh, we it's useful to, uh, in to, to predict what might happen, it's useful to uh, compare uh, room acoustics with uh, the waves, um, uh, wa uh, surface waves in, uh, say, a body of water. Uh, if we uh, drop a stone that's going to be generating an impulse, drop a stone in, say, a bathtub, um, and we see uh, you know, waves coming out from the place where the stone uh, uh, fell, um, and we turn away and we look at it again uh, after a few seconds. When we look at it, it's impossible to tell where the, sto when the, where the stone was, uh, fell into the tub. And it's also, um, if we take time to look at it longer, we're going to see the, there's a random process over the whole uh, wavelets, basically, on, on the tub. And they become less and less intense. The amplitude reduces. They become also less and less uh, sharp in, in their shape. So they lose high frequencies. But it's everywhere the same in the, in the whole tub. There's not a part of the tub where there's more energy than another part of the tub. So it's going to be, essentially, uh, I, I find that useful to think of uh, uh, diffuse reverberation in a room uh, because we can predict with that analogy uh, what will happen uh, at different positions uh, of listening, different position of the source. We can use the principle of reciprocity to predict what happens when the listener moves or the source moves. And generally speaking, what we can predict is uh, if there's no decay, let's say there's infinite, no absorption at all, uh, then the energy uh, that we observe at any point, uh, one thing we know is that it, we're gonna, it's going to be inversely proportional to the volume of the room because the energy has to go everywhere, the same amount everywhere. So the larger the room, uh, proportionally, uh, the lower uh, the energy. So the energy proportional to the inverse of the room volume. Obviously proportional to the power radiated by the source. So if the source and radiated in diffuse field, so it's a diffuse field transfer function of the source that matters. And we're so therefore the static, again, there's still no decay at this point. The static uh, spectrum we're going to see everywhere in the room is the diffuse field transfer function of the source scaled by the room volume. And now uh, let's consider absorption. Uh, clearly, we're going to start from the same point. At time zero, this is the energy we start from. But then it decays exponentially with different rates at, uh, at different frequencies. And that's our model. So uh, one of the things we can predict is that if we compare being close to uh, having the listener close to the source or the source close to the listener or changing the distance, um, and we have in mind that when we simulate this, uh, it's going to be with a network that synthesizes some early reflections and a second network that synthesizes the late reverberation. And let's say that the, the typical uh, approach to implement this is to take something that maybe generates about 50 milliseconds of early reflections and stitch the late reverberation right after that. Just so there's no gap between the early reflections and the late reverberation like I show here. So that's a principle of superposition. I have the drag path, another network that does early reflections, and another one that does late reverberation. So here I am at six feet from the source. And the next picture, I'm 24 feet from the source. I'm still using the same early reflection module that takes care of 15 milliseconds of my impulse response. Of course, the delay, everything has been shifted in time if I want to simulate uh, the propagation delay. But now, the reverberation I'm stitching at the end of that, I need to attenuate it. Because uh, by the time the late reverberation reaches the listener, it has lost some energy because of the decay time. So the distance model uh, you know, that we have to uh, apply now that we're considering a source that might move or multiple sources at different distances is that we actually have to attenuate uh, the late reverberation feed in, for each source according to its power uh, transfer function, diffuse field tra transfer function, and the distances that the source is uh, to the listener. At this point, we have a model that is, in fact, completely independent of what source I'm using and where the source is in the room. 
because we're talking about diffuse fields, so we don't care where the walls are. We only uh, want to know the distance and the diffuse field uh, transfer function of the source. So this is a model we can use whether we're using convolution for the reverberation or, or feedback delay networks. But it's critical to do that unless the room is so small that we never go really far from the source. So we don't have to do this attenuation, but we still have to take care of the uh, diffuse field transfer function of the source and the diffuse field transfer function of the listener as well. So the, typically the diffuse field HRTFs are going to be necessary for the rendering, for binaural rendering. Okay. Uh, so, well, this is just simulating what I uh, said uh, in the previous slide. Uh, what are the effects of room dimension, source directivity, and uh, distance? So at this point, uh, I'm going to, to go into game, uh, game development. Um, uh, starting uh, late 90s, uh, games did not have reverberation. Uh, game engines, uh, all these number ones like I3DL1, A3D1, EX1, they were various proposals for representing the acoustic scene in a game with sources moving, multiple sources, etc. But there was no reverberation at that point. Uh, and, and when I actually joined Creative Labs, it was this already existed. All, all these versions without reverberation existed. And so, I w in fact, EX1 had just introduced reverberation, uh, late reverberation, uh, basically reverberation presets in games. So uh, it was a great opportunity to try to use these reverb models in games and tr start to, uh, on a path or roadmap, to make the environments more and more complex, the simulations more and more complex. So there was the problem of what about an obstacle between the listener and the source? There's going to be a muffling effect because the sound has to go through the obstacle or around it due to diffraction or uh, transmission through the obstacle. Uh, so we had to put some filters in the network because of that. Um, what if you go from a room to another and now the reverberation engine needs to uh, morph into the reverberation of another room? But then what if there are multiple rooms? And so you're in between two rooms. There's a room you just left behind you and the room you're walking into in front of you. Now we have to render both reverberations because we may have sources in the old room and sources in the new room. And we can hear the reverberation of both. And I'm going to have a demo a little later uh, where you can actually uh, definitely hear that. Uh, so multiple reverbs, multiple sources. Uh, Rendering the reverb on your own voice is also an interesting uh, uh, challenge. Um, so basically, uh, you know, every four years or so, there would be a new generation of a standard or a proposed algorithm to uh, render these things. And uh, the, at the bottom of the EX versions, uh, and so there was one like every two years or so. Um, and at the end, we had a model, and I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of what that sounds like. Uh, it's still very old stuff. It's about uh, you know, 15 years ago now, almost. Uh, but more recently, uh, uh, there's been a, uh, an increase of interest in this because of vir virtual reality. And so some companies were formed uh, from people coming out of this uh, group, for instance, uh, Stefan's group. Uh, that was two big ears and been, were acquired by Facebook. Another one coming from a uh, university, I'm going to forget, Professor Manosha's uh, team. Uh, uh, students uh, funded Impulsonic, and they were bought by Valve. Uh, Google is busy on this. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD are very excited because it looks like it's going to use a lot of computation, and so they can sell new generations of chips. Um, so we, we have a, a lot of interest in all that 3D audio, especially dynamic uh, 3D audio uh, stuff now. And, and you need to be able to run this on the web. You know, Google applications, they run on the web. And, and so there's cinematic VR there, and there's no real-time reverberation or anything going on. But there's also interactive VR, uh, things like uh, Spotlight Stories. Um, so Google wants to have an implementation of those uh, rendering engines that can run on a wide range of platforms. Uh, so you know, NVIDIA and AMD, they put GPUs in there, and you can have convolution farms going. Uh, but the web applications are going to run on uh, you know, your old uh, laptops or mobile phones. And you still want to get the most you can from these uh, platforms. 
but it has also uh, caused a re uh, renewed interest in physics-based rendering. Uh, kind of activities also uh, going on uh, in Stefan's group. Um, and so it's a rebirth uh, of attempts that were made in the 2000s with dynamic reflections. Uh, MPEG-4 had a proposal for that. Uh, VESA was involved in that, I'm sure. Um, A3D2, that was Aureole, also dynamic early reflections. Uh, all very, very cool technology, but at the time it was too complicated to author and render uh, those things. And now the platforms are more ready for those uh, physics-based uh, real-time rendering engines. Uh, so this is an example of technology from Google. It uh, just was announced very recently, became public, the Google Soundbird. And you, you know, this looks like exactly the kind of thing we were doing in the 90s, but now that needs to run in real time in a web browser uh, using JavaScript. So uh, quickly going over this evolution, at first, we had only one reverberation, and we were worried about rendering the effects of uh, rendering the reverberation and the effects of obstacles uh, of sources that are not in the same room, etc. Uh, added the distance model and the uh, diffuse field transfer function, all that stuff was in there, but it's only one room. Um, so uh, how did that? We defined, we, we basically, when you walk from a room to another, each room would have a reverberation preset associated to it. And so it were certain rules defined in advance as to how the reverberation and the direct sound and the reflections de roll off with distance. Uh, so all done automatically. And for each source, you would have the proper uh, roll off happening. Uh, these were some of the uh, curves that we try to, behaviors that we try to standardize so that whoever authors the content, it, you can expect that it sounds pretty much the same even if it's on different sound cards or different pieces of hardware. So we had defined actually a proportional uh, model for the um, effect of muffling. Uh, so it was a proportional equalizer as well. Um, this is a quick review of the two groups of properties. You, have, you had properties for the environment and the listener, and properties for each of the sources. I'm going to go quickly over those things. So you know, big control panels. So when, when we had to QA, uh, the, the, the test validate everything, every one of these properties, we need a big control panel and do listening tests, critical listening tests to verify everything is sounding correct. But you had properties for the source, the listener, uh, the reverberation, et cetera. And you have this three-dimensional view that I described earlier. We would plot this so that people can, can quickly see whether uh, what they're listening to and what they were intending to do is, is what is correct. And so at that point, we had one room with a reverberation of that room. But the problem was that. Uh, it, it was a pretty rich model already to simulate effects of uh, uh, you know, obstacles, et cetera. But uh, if the sounds were in another room, they had no reverb on them. So it was OK to simulate the house in the middle of the prairie uh, with nothing connected to it. But it, it was not a perfectly realistic model with a, mo a typical environment with multiple connected rooms. So at that point, we had to use the, the principle of superposition, which is basically each of these, in this case, these instruments, they have to be allowed to feed a different reverberation uh, algorithm corresponding to the room they're in to simulate this, which is you know, each instrument feeding uh, the reverberation corresponding to its own room, and then the output of these reverberators feeding the room the listener is in according to absorption through walls, or uh, coming through an opening, uh, like a door. Uh, and then when the listener moves around, well, now they go into the room that used to be an opening. So now it, it needs to open up so that it's all, or the reverberation is all around you. So again, lots of properties, lots of knobs to test. Uh, these are typically when you program an application, you don't have the knobs. You, you, you make uh, program calls, C calls, C++ calls to adjust all these properties. But if you were a mixer trying to create an, a recording, the, all of these would be knobs in your mixing console. But uh, so each of the slots you see on the left side, e each one could have a reverberator in it. We actually allowed to have other kinds of effects in the slots. Uh, so that model was uh, around 2005. And it, was, it migrated into uh, OpenAL, an open source uh, uh, API to author content in games. Uh, so it's called the OpenAL effects extension, EFX. Um, 
so this is the now the source property set, lots of knobs again. But you know, it's a lot of control that's already available uh, with that. Uh, and still, you can either implement it with feedback delay networks for the reverbs or with convolution. Uh, but what's useful in that is that it's totally parametric. So you don't have to simulate a, a room that actually exists. Uh, you, you can actually tune the sound, uh, do sound design according to what you want. So this is an, a simulation of the OpenAL EFX or EX4 with multiple environments uh, and also mul multiple sounds. Okay, so what we were hearing here is a system that looks like this, where uh, maybe I'll quickly. Uh, ah, okay, so for there's one source, you have multiple sources playing. For each source, there's a path to send the audio into. In this case, it were, this is a diagram for binaural rendering, so there's a virtualizer, but all the HRTF processing is in one place in order to save uh, computation. What's happening here is very simple panning. It could be ambisonics, for instance. Uh, we have proportional equalizers here, uh, one for the direct path and one for each of the send feeds into each of the reverbs. So we have here three reverbs shown. In this example, you had one for the big room, one for the small room where the character steps in at one point, and probably also one for the corridor in between them. And you were probably able to notice that there's a point when the character steps into the small room, they st you still hear the reverb of the big room because there was some activity there. Uh, so we need two reverberators running in parallel to render that. But probably, I didn't notice it, but probably there was also the reverb of the, of the corridor that was uh, audible at the same time. On the output, we have panners because we, you've probably noticed that the reverb, on purpose for this demo, we play huge reverb and then we turn around. So you hear the reverb uh, panning around you because it's coming from an opening. Um, so this is why you have those panners here, multi-channel panners, and you have more uh, proportional equalizers at the output in the, to render the case where the reverberation maybe comes through a wall um, from another room. Uh, I may be skipping a few things. So, so the proportional equalizers up there, uh, that's where we can input the diffuse field transfer functions of each of the sounds. Whereas here we have a free field transfer function for the for the direct path. Um, more recently, uh, actually in 2006 or seven, um, I, since we had that previous model, I started to worry about okay, now maybe it would be good to do something about the earlier reflections because I've been talking about late reverberation all along. Um, so the idea here is that uh, one of these reverberators. It's going, let's just say that we keep track of which one of them is the one that's associated to the room that the character is in. And we're going to say we care about the audio reflections that are going on in that room. Um, then uh, what would be nice if we, is if we had a way to simulate the early reflections without simulating a mirror source for each reflection for each source, because that's a lot of sources. And we were on a... Uh, small sound cards, a hundred dollar sound card. So the idea was to try to uh, have a, reflect, a reverberator that was in charge of just the early reflections uh, 
and that all the sources, again, can feed into that reverberator. So this is just one source, but there's a large number of sound sources that are allowed to feed each of these reverberators. But this one only does a small amount, a uh, small time section of impulse, uh, the impulse response. Uh, however, it's shared between all the sources. And if each source is able to feed into it such that it'll, what will come out will come from a certain direction with a certain delay and with a certain amplitude, now you have a global control for early reflections for each source uh, in terms of pre-delay, uh, panning, more or less focus, more or less diffuse, and uh, amplitude. Uh, so this is a beginning uh, to try to make the early reflections uh, dynamic as well. And we never ship this in a sound card, so I don't know what it sounds like. But that would be the uh, um, that was uh, uh, you know ten years later maybe I'm, I'm going to get a chance to go back to working on that. Um, so as a conclusion, um, very very quickly, uh, talk. Let's talk about augmented reality a little bit. So now uh, the, those devices that you can wear, uh, they have little loudspeakers in them. You can still hear the sound coming from the outside world, but. You, uh, the device allows you to superpose some s virtual sounds, synthetic sounds. And there's already several companies working on it, and, in, and I'm in one of them. Uh, and another thing that's, you know, th this is, these are new devices, but the idea of augmented reality audio actually, to my knowledge, is, uh, it was first discussed in publications from uh, the Alto, or what's now called the Alto University, where VESA works. Um, where at that point it was more the consideration of having earbuds that have microphones on them so that you can uh, transmit the sound directly uh, from the outside into the earbud while adding uh, additional sounds. And already in those papers it was described that if you do that well it becomes really difficult to tell which ones are sounds that are coming from the real world and which ones are completely synthetic sounds. But in order to do that, we're going to have to simulate the reverberation of the room we're in and apply that to the virtual sound sources. So uh, more recently, uh, l last year, I was at DTS uh, before I joined uh, Magic Leap. And I started to work on uh, this problem. Uh, how can we, the ideal situation, you would have a duet, a virtual duet of say two instruments where one of them is real, is there, the other, one, the other one is virtual, but if you close your eyes you can't tell which one it is virtual and which one is real. Uh, so we're going to have to do a pretty good job with the artificial reverberation if we want that to happen because otherwise it's obvious one, one instrument makes a note, it's too dry or it's too reverberant, it doesn't have the right reverb coloration on it. Um, and so to try to address this, um, I, that's how uh, I, I felt it was a good idea to define the concept of reverberation fingerprint. Uh, because there's at least one thing we can do pretty well based on everything we discussed so far is that we can, if we can characterize the reverberation of the local room where you are, we're going to be able to apply a reverberation to the synthetic sound that's going to be very, very difficult to distinguish from the reverberation of, that we would experience if that sound were actually playing in the room. And so it is entirely defined by the cubic volume of the room and the decay rate as a function of frequency. Uh, and we can view that it's a characterization of the room and we know how to couple any sound source to it because all we need to know about it is how far it is and what is its diffuse field transfer function. Uh, and same for the listener, we need to have the diffuse field HRTFs of the listener uh, to, to do that well. Uh, so an example would be, let's say that I had measured an impulse response in another room uh, that is not the room I'm in, but I also uh, know the reverberation fingerprint of the room I'm in. So that's what you see here. Um, this is the re a reference room. It's not the room I'm in, but if I use that reverberation while there's another instrument playing in the room I'm in, I can see that the room I'm in has louder reverberation, longer reverberation, so pretty soon my brain would start to notice there's something wrong because it's supposed to be a duet with two instruments in the same room, but the reverberations are different. Uh, so the room I'm in has a longer decay time we see here, and the other one has a shorter decay time. If I want to, if I have the impulse response of this room, I can sculpt it to give it the same decay time as this one, and that's what we see here. And 
to boost it a little bit so that the initial uh, energy is the same as this one. So it's a very simple modification. I can do that in the time frequency domain with the same method we use to denoise the end of an impulse response. Or based on what we just described, I, we can do this also with, with a feedback delay network. And that'll take, uh, take care of the late reverberation. And we still have a problem with uh, the early reflections. What are we going to do about those? Uh, well, one thing we can do very simply is to continue the same offset. We apply at each frequency and time a certain dB offset. If we apply the same dB offset also to the early reflections, even though we're not in the diffuse reverberation, we get something like this. And now if we compare uh, you know, the impulse response that we would synthesize versus the impulse response uh, that a real instrument in the room I'm in, now they're much more difficult to distinguish than these two. Uh, so I only have that graphically. I haven't had a chance to hear it. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is my, the latest uh, effort to try to get to this point. Um, and it relies on this concept of reverberation fingerprint. So to recap, um, we define this notion of reverberation fingerprint. It's, the, it's in fact the time frequency envelope of the diffuse field reverb decay in the room. It is valid for any source or listener properties or directivities. And it requires knowing the decay time in a few frequency bands, let's say 10 frequency bands, and the room volume, or the, basically something to uh, reference the loudness of the reverberation. So we need about 10 bytes of data for each room. We could map the whole world with 10 bytes of data for each room, like Google Maps, uh, and we would have this uh, taken care of. Uh, we described how to obtain the reverberation fingerprint from a measurement how to uh, synthesize it for any source uh, and listener position uh, couple, but also how to couple any uh, number of sources to it, how to navigate from one environment to another where we know their reverberation fingerprints, and how to render that in a manner that's scalable, or with, for instance, feedback delay networks, but also uh, GPU uh, convolution farms, if we prefer, if those are available. And the main challenge we have now is how to render the early reflections in a way I'm a little bit more uh, accurate than what I described. How to take care of open environments where there isn't a mix, uh, the diffuse late reverb decay is something we may not find. So how are we going to handle that? It's kind of the same problem as early reflections. Um, validation, how, how well does the synthetic, uh, the real and the virtual compare now that we're able to do this, especially in augmented reality? And then uh, how to uh, have a system such that if I have a room where I don't know the reverberation fingerprint, could I walk into this room and have a system that finds it as I walk into the room? Uh, and yeah, it doesn't look like it would be very difficult. So we tried, uh, actually, uh, two students uh, who are at Stanford, Stanford right now in master's have uh, written a little paper with me where we were hopeful that if you have about 10 seconds of speech in a room, you walk in and there's 10 seconds of noise, maybe wideband noise, the system could analyze that online blind estimation uh, and figure out the reverberation fingerprint of the room you just walked in. So that's uh, where I am at this point, and that's my conclusion. I've, oh, next challenges, I already said that. <laughs> so uh, that's all for me today. Thank you.